First of all, thank you immensely for um, the time that you spent introducing yourselves and talking about what you hope to get out of this. Um, so the result of that is that this presentation is rapidly evolving. So I'm gonna talk more about some studies um, and less about others, but at any point, if you say, whoa, whoa, what, go, go back, that is perfectly okay, but I really wanna talk to some of the things that you specifically addressed. <clears throat> okay, so for this section, um, we're gonna be talking about just simply great assessment studies that have been published. Um, I, I tried to think of a, a theme, but the subtext here is that these are just studies that I think are really awesome. It's a, as simple as that. Um, I have a sort of assessment envy for them. I would like to emulate them. I'd like to reproduce them. And so um, in order to give them their, their due diligence, I am sharing them with you as an opportunity to take advantage and take it back to your institutions. Most of these are in these themes. Now, the, the border around our presentation is actually inspired by this image. Think about um, your mouse pad or your touch pad on your, on your device, right? So it shows no evidence of you're using it, although many of you are using them right now, right? Right. So what, what would you learn about yourself if you could see what your touchpad sees, if you could visualize what your mouse pad has seen about you, right? This is evidence, this is a visualization of uh, somebody who tracked their, their mouse path, I can't remember what, how long the time span was, but I, I just love the idea of this. That we, we behave all day long, we, we participate in activities, we do things in our libraries, we spend money, we walk around, we teach, but what evidence do we have of that activity? So that's the theme of these case studies, that they're just really great evidence, and we'll carry through that. The first thing that I wanna talk about is, um, is actually really interesting. So we went around the room and we talked about things that we wanted to learn about assessment. Uh, unfortunately, no one mentioned that they wanted to assess space in their library, right? right nobody said, I have a fantastic facility I would really love to learn uh, what kind of seating would be, would be great and uh, how people move within it. Assessing space is often an afterthought, right? Uh, somebody comes and says, hey, I've got, I've got a donor who's willing to maybe put their name on something. You wanna buy some furniture? <laughs> right, and then you're like, oh yeah. Um, you know, I walk between my office and the front door and I see a lot of people talking at individual study carols, so maybe we need to add some more double, double type of tables, right? Yeah. Space is an afterthought. And this study in 2011, it's actually not a study. It's a call to action to say that we need to assess space proactively rather than reactively. We need to think about our space very deliberately. Um, in this study, they talk about the ACRL generic statements for space that they are based on enrollment, um, regardless of whether you have on-campus enrollment, off-campus enrollment, the difference, um, whether or not you have a high population of commuters, whether or not you have a high population of first-generation college students or um, people, students who have low socioeconomic status and maybe don't necessarily have three devices with them. Um, everything that we know about space uh, right now is largely generic. This study talks about um, the Ithaca surveys, which are fantastic, um, some of which could inform what we know about space. Uh, in the Ithaca surveys, they're doing a longitudinal study of faculty, and in that, the paradigms have shifted. So we've changed from, in our perspective, the perspective of libraries from faculty as being gatekeepers and more of the, the buyer role, right, which we know, we see that in our own um, work often, but um, in the Ithaca study, there's, the faculty don't know what to do with library space either, right? There's good evidence of that. Let me pause here and tell you this. A lot of the studies that I have selected have been published after Megan Oakleaf's report. Some of them have been published before. Um, almost in, 
all of them that have been published after cite the report and many others. There are names that pop up among these um, over and over again. Um, but you can tell that a lot of work is being done after that report. So the next one, just recently studied, or recently published, sorry. This one's so cool. Yes. So, I'm going to ask you to go back slide. Man, I was I just led into this. this one. is so cool, and you're going to make me go backwards? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. So I, I think, in, and just like I said, that often assessment of space is an afterthought. We all have some version of space. We have physical space and virtual space. And we like to assume that naturally having that space does contribute to the value of the library in an academic institution. But this, this um, call to assess a space is really about saying that, that stop making it be an afterthought and really put it at the forefront. Um, the forefront of assessment in libraries is really about collections and learning. And that completely ignores the value that we have within our physical space as nurturing a student environment, a teaching and learning environment, um, su supporting the entire student and the entire faculty experience. Absolutely. Does that answer your question? All right, now can we go on to the, the really cool now, one? <sighs> All right, so this one. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so this one, oh man, this one is so cool. Okay, so it just came out. It was published in Library and Information Science Research. And uh, this is the, this is a, a study where they used ArcGIS to figure out how users were using their space, right? So libraries are interdisciplinary by nature. We cover all of the disciplines within our space. Aside from those of you who are specialized, I'm, I'm speaking generically here, I apologize. Um, and, and we, library research dabbles in educational theory, uh, it dabbles in psychology some, it gets into economics. This is a great application of libraries and another discipline, geography, really sort of crossing paths and figuring out what happens. So they did a, a map of the seating, their, their uh, stacks in their libraries. Uh, they even did a map of their electrical outlets and started sweeping. So they would send someone around with an Excel document and they would track what people had with them. How many of them had a book bag? How many of them had food? How many of them had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven devices, right? How many of them were in a conversation? How many of them were just simply reading? How many of them were dragging an extension cord from one space to another? And then they visualized it using ArcGIS. So this is just one of the maps that appear in this study. So from this, you can see that, um, I'm gonna maybe use the, no, it's not here, hold on. Over here, can you see this, right here? Pointer, right, okay. So this area is individual study carols, and it is packed a huge percentage of the time on a regular basis, right? Um, they are, and this is um, individuals who are just reading or writing. They have different spaces, but I want you to notice there's this way up here in the top. They have one individual in their stacks tracked, right? Like, and that is um, rarely used because of the size of the dot. Right. Few people spend time in the stacks is what we're learning from this. And then how much of our physical space is devoted to those stacks versus the reading and learning 
in conversations that occur at the seating elsewhere. How much could you learn about your physical library space if you did a visual sweep of what people were doing in your space? Yes. So did you reduce stacks and increase? From evidence. Yes. OK, great. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. There are um, a number of other images in this study that I, I chose not to just dominate this um, presentation with, but there's great stuff in there. Start thinking about how we can um, Look at our, our physical space. Yes. Yeah, but they haven't, they don't know a lot from that yet, right? Yeah, yeah. It looks really cool. Yeah, you're right. Um, yes, so the, what is the name of the, Measure the future, and it's unobtrusive. Rather than having a person go around and count who's doing what, right? These are um, sensors that tell what's going on in each room and how people move from, from space to space, yeah. I think one, one key important thing here is that um, these measures, particularly for physical space, need to be unobtrusive. I think that um, when people know they're being watched, they do change their behavior, so it's important to keep that in mind. All right, and we can't forget about our virtual. Sp oh, yeah, I'm sorry. They're just not there all that much. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. It does. It is on the table for reading and writing. Um, I don't know if those individuals were hanging out there. I'm not. It's not really spelled out. But some of the others talk more. Um, some of the other images show more that the stacks are not being used for a lot of activity. Okay, so our virtual space. Our virtual space, our websites. Um, there are a lot of studies assessing how, um, usability studies and that sort of thing, but what I really like about this particular one um, published before the Megan Oakleaf report is that they isolated activity to their websites <clears throat> from users who were not local in an attempt to figure out how useful their websites were to distant students. And they did that using Google Analytics, a free service that you can put on any website. Um, this, this study actually, in a, in a very somewhat snarky comment for a peer-reviewed journal article, um, indicated that IT wouldn't let them do a lot of things, so they had to figure out how to do it themselves. And they, um, they put their site behind Google Analytics, they put the, the script on so that they could track how users were getting to their site and then what they were clicking on from there. And from that, they, um, they found that distant students were not finding their tutorials that they had created largely for distant students, right? So then they worked with their Office of Distance Learning and completely reworked um, how the website was organized to better reach those distant students. Any questions about this one? No. Okay. This, this is an old version of this presentation because this slide's not supposed to be here. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna skip it right now and then we're gonna come back to it, okay? All right, teaser. Okay, so um, a lot of you talked about assessing collections, and so for that reason, I'm gonna talk a lot about this particular study. Um, this is Madeline Kelly from Georgia Mason University. Georgia Mason is um, a very high research institution, and 
I really love this study about collections because they use a multifaceted approach to assessing collections, all right? Um, they essentially went through and did a substantial analysis of each subject, not LC class, but subject. And then from that, determined what level of assessment would be needed in order for them to grow their collection. This was not an assessment that was um, initiated due to a weeding concern, which many of us have. This is really about growth of collection and acquiring the level of assessment or level of collection that we'd really like. Um, so they went through, here are three different subjects. We have linguistics, arts management, and forensic science. And then they applied multiple different collection assessment methods to each discipline to determine what to do next, okay? So I'm gonna talk through this slide because there's a lot here, but it process and then we'll, we'll ask questions, okay? So they determined where they were now, assigned level um, 3C. They determined the, the level of assessment means how much assessment they wanted to do. And that was determined by the person who was doing the assessment, one person. They had one person doing the assessment working with each of their liaison librarians to determine um, how much assessment needed to be done. And they noted that the fact that it was one person made the process much more seamless because once they got a few disciplines down, they were able to do the others very quickly. So linguistics got a much higher level of assessment than arts management and forensics because those are tier two. They determined um, you know, the highest degree offered, the goal level, and that is um, you know, that traditional five level assessment and then they've broken up you know, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then three has three levels a, B, and C for the level of assessment that we do for collections. They went through and um, determined the percent of serials that they would want to have, the number of bibliographies, the number of outstanding academic titles, whether or not they were matching up with their peer libraries for databases, journals, and um, certain book collections where they stand in those peer rankings, the amount of holdings that they have before and after a certain date, how much of the materials that they would want in English or in other languages, uh, how much they want to either lend through ILL or if they want to rely on borrowing for ILL largely for that subject, and how much they would rather have in print or electronic. Um, these, lower down, these were um, determined by surveys with faculty and the subject specialists. Yeah. This study is different than a lot of the other assessment studies for collections because they tend to rely on one method, right? And they may be um, subject specific. A lot of things that are published may be about a particular LC class or for a particular discipline, um, but this one really covers all of them. And they uh, discussed how important the multi-method approach was, particularly for interdisciplinary disciplines, because um, LC class tends to be so limiting. And a lot of the um, bibliographies, a lot of the, the lists, the list of things you should have for this discipline, um, they get outdated very quickly, but they do tend to not be friendly for interdisciplinary subjects, right? Yes. Yeah, it, I think this leads to the money, right? Um, because it, they can put the money where they have the largest gap between where they are and where they hope to be, right? They talk a little bit about that, but this really, this study really is about just assessing and less about the practice of what to do um, with the money afterwards. Yes? Yeah, I was going to cover, thank you. Um, this one is not, and most of these are not, but we have your email addresses. So I'll just go through and 
and send you all these citations. How about that? The, the citations that are in your list, at least the ones that I added, are, are broader assessment level citations. They are not these specific studies. Um, do you want to hear what was in each tier? Yeah. You want to pause here? Okay, great. All right, so tier one, anything that was at tier one, um, they did an OCLC collection evaluation, which, um, is that the one that no longer exists? Yeah, so OCLC recently bought Green Glass. Oh, you're talking, yes, the, the OCLC collection evaluation. Yeah, yes. yeah, so, uh, so they used a tool that no longer exists since the, this um, came out or since this study was run. Um, OCLC has bought a service called Green Glass. Uh, we've implemented that at my institution and it is, it is a very good service. Um, but it allows you to visualize by LC class um, the number of circulations you have, your peer, your peer institutions, what your holdings are, it taps into WorldCat quite heavily. Um, so it would be a substitution for the collection evaluation thing. Um, they did some basic list checking against bibliographies. They um, did the, the White's brief test of collection strength, which is the five level one. For tier two, they did all of those things and added ILL statistics, citation analysis from core journals, um, use data for e-journals and databases, and then they added at, at tier two, the faculty and graduate student surveys. So that's why you see a lot, a lot of the other stuff down at the bottom for all of these that include tier, tier two. Tier three did all of those things and added citation analysis of monographs and then went into particular accreditation guidelines if they were applicable. I would suggest maybe that belongs in tier one or two, but hey, it's, they did great work either way. Right. Um, any questions about this one? Yes? How long did it take them to complete this? So they started with a couple of disciplines um, and they set a couple of months, but it was one person who was tasked with this entirely, right? So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't sound like there was a lot else going on. I mean, this is George Mason, high level research institution where you can uh, maybe devote one, one person to do this. Um, and then it's, it's cyclical, so you, they, are, they started and then did everything and then are trying to go back and do it all again. Anything else? Any other stuff? This one's, this one's this is really cool too. Okay, this one, in the grand scheme of things, maybe a smaller study. But I added it in here because I think it's important to know that assessment can occur at all levels. You don't have to do an entire collection evaluation to be doing good assessment. Um, I actually saw a presentation about this particular topic at a conference, and um, I was really pleased when it came out in the Journal of Academic Librarianship. This study simply documented what happened after a library ceased late fees. Just simply that one, um, that one change, they decided to see what happened. They used a lot of qualitative measures. They sent out an email saying, hey, by the way, we're not gonna charge late fees anymore. And then they tracked the feedback that they got, which was fantastic qualitative feedback. Uh, in fact, they, they noted that one person said, hey, great, you're not charging late fees anymore. I'm, I'm gonna come by and check something out, right? But then on a um, quantitative level, there was some fear among their library faculty that no longer charging late fees would mean that things stay out longer and they had a policy at their institution that um, you could interlibrary loan things that were checked out. So they feared that they would be spending more money um, acquiring things through interlibrary loan that they had but that were just checked out for longer. And uh, fortunately enough, they, they saw no increase in the amount of things that were being interlibrary loaned from other institutions um, to cover the things that they already owned, right? It was a great, maybe smaller scale than, than often these other things are, but a great little piece of assessment that adds to an overall picture and overall um, library value communication. 
All right, now let's get to, um, let's get to learning. This particular study uh, is subject specific. This is about chemistry. It's about a chemistry program. And uh, the library faculty and some instructional designers worked with an honors chemistry class. And they did library instruction, very deliberate, very specific learning outcomes. And then they uh, tracked them over time to figure out what resources they continue to use. So academic year 2011 um, was the first, that first cohort, that first year. And then as you go down, that's the same group of people after that and the resources that they used. And they determined that um, although some people would say that doing intensive um, SciFinder Scholar Web of Science level um, teaching at an honors chemistry class in a first year cohort would maybe be in too intensive. Um, this indicated that getting to them early and teaching them early meant that they continued to use those resources throughout their, their collegiate career. Right? Yeah? I'm sorry, I didn't hear everything that you said, but it sounded like you were saying that there is a lot of evidence for getting to them early, despite what people say. Not too much too soon, but early is definitely good. Yeah. All right, next one. This is a study where um, library faculty worked with instructors in a couple of different disciplines. They looked at two levels of uh, composition courses, and then a psychology class and a history class. They looked at papers and they applied the value rubric to a large number of papers. And they went through librarians, went through student work, and uh, applied the value rubric for information literacy um, to these papers. And this is a, a great study because it is interdisciplinary. We know what is happening in um, different disciplines on one campus, although they did really select a, a university studies type of class and then a couple of discipline specific ones. But this helped the librarians see the finished product, which happens so rarely in higher ed. You know, we, um, if you're a teaching librarian, you know that you do a lot of teaching and you see a lot of the questions and you help a lot with lit review. And you know, or at least you hope, that they turned that paper in, but we don't get to see the product that they actually, they actually completed. So this was a, a huge, labor-intensive project, but they found out a lot about um, what their students are capable of doing at each level of class. So this is just one of the tables, this is category three, so the ability to evaluate information. From this, you can see that in the rubric, um, history students, history 4990, um, were performing probably at a lower level for evaluating information than the psychology three, three five zero zero students were. And the English classes, the composition classes, sort of tell us where it is in a formative practice, what they're capable of doing while they're forming um, these skills. But I think that the discipline level, the discipline faculty and the librarians who had, who had reached the psychology and the history classes really hoped that the value rubric would show evidence that they were um, reaching a summative sort of level, a mastery level for evaluating information here, and they found that that simply wasn't the case. They have one of these charts for each of the other categories, 
but this is just one um, just to show the difference between how uh, at this institution students were able to evaluate information in even just different classes. But remember this slide from earlier? We talked about Megan Oakleaf's call to action about um, communicating library value in a, in a more effective way. The studies that I have shown you so far are great pieces of assessment and they do help us learn, they do help us communicate better our value. But none of them really touch on this list that Megan Oakleaf provided that would help libraries um, actually reach institutional priorities. There are some studies that are, that are coming out and more and more um, each week that do attempt at this list. Most of them, though, tend to be in the top of that left-hand column there, okay? So here's some great studies that sort of get to this. This is um, a study from Gabby Haddow, who is in Australia. Um, there are a couple of Haddow studies. I recommend a lot of them. I have a lot of inst uh, institutional and assessment envy for what she is capable of doing, frankly. Um, but this is just simply one. So at her institution in Australia, she has um, the capability to tie a lot of student behavior to uh, a lot of other behavior, particularly library level behavior, because of the way that their um, institutional assessment is built. So she could figure out if there was a correlation between checkouts and um, whether or not people ate on campus that day. Okay, she has that capability. I have envy for that sort of, sort of capability. Um, but she has focused this power for good, primarily on um, determining the impact of, of the library and the services and the collections that they have on student retention. So <clears throat> this chart is about students and how many times they have logged into electronic resources and whether or not they were, be, they were able to be retained into the next semester. And there is a statistical significance between students who are showing engagement in some way and logging into library electronic resources and whether or not they stick around and continue to come back. This is a, a core value for, for our institutions, right? Because we don't want to recruit students over and over again. Once, recruit, once we have recruited them once, we'd like them to stay until completion. Question? Yeah. This was possible because of the the um, assessment capability at the entire institution, right? So they have one of those mega assessment systems and everybody plugs in data into a bunch of little silos into the system and then anyone with access to it can find correlations across the little silos, okay? So there are a number of Haddow studies at her institution. Um, I don't know that they are overall program assessment. I don't re recall that they are tied to anything um, broader than just simple curiosity and then sort of um, speaking to the overall value of, of the library when it comes to student retention and other sorts of initiatives. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so they have um, forced all users to log in in order to use their resources, okay? So some institutions are starting to do this. We use Easy Proxy at my institution. And regardless of whether or not you're on campus or off campus, you must log in to get access to proprietary resources. And that login, uh, at least the way that it works at my institution, uh, is tied to your institutional ID. Um, there are there are some gaps here, so this isn't 
This is logins, which is usually good for a time period and then it'll time out, right? So this isn't actual number of resources used. This is just um, initiating an action that authenticates you to do something for a certain period of time. So you don't actually know that the student is logged in? Correct. Yeah. But it takes a proactive um, behavior in order to actually do that. Right? Yeah. Yes? No, we do not know that it is causal. Thank you for, for making that statement. Um, we do not know that it is causal, it is correlational. There is a relationship between activity that um, you have to actually um, take the steps. It is, it is an indication of engagement, that you have to take the steps to actually log in, to um, actually use interlibrary loan, to actually check something out. Uh, and whether or not a student is able to be retained. So extrapolating from that, we may be able to sort of um, create an alert system for students who haven't had that behavior, who haven't had any of that engagement, and reach out to those students, maybe through a student retention office or something like that, to say, hey, you know, we, are, is everything okay? Are you doing well in your classes? Is there something we should know about? And I don't necessarily know that that is a, a library role, but we can speak to that because of that known relationship that is actually popping up in multiple institutions. Here's another one. There are a couple of the um, Soraya et al. Um, studies as well, but this is what's happening at the University of Minnesota. They did a similar type of thing. Um, they tracked library use over a couple, defined a couple different ways. Library use can be defined in different ways and a lot of these studies are defining them differently. But they tracked library use um, and tied it to retention. They found a positive relationship and they also tied it to GPA. So in this, um, in this case, for first time freshmen, students who used the library had an average of a 3.18. GPA, first time freshman students, those who didn't had an average of a 2.98, and that was also statistically significant. Causal, no. Correlational, some type of relationship, we know that um, engagement is occurring there. <clears throat> hey, remember, remember when I did that teaser thing? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna take a trip back. No, no, not that one. This is a good trip, right? We've had fond memories along the way. Not that, not, no. No, did I go too far? No. This one, all right, okay, sorry. This one is so cool too. Oh man, okay. So this um, is at multiple institutions, we had, uh, people collaborating here. We had UC Irvine, Boston College, and the University of Miami. This is a new study too, 2015. They created a warehouse of library data, library use data, also defined somewhat differently. We'll get to that in a minute. They combined it with uh, data from the registrar and also from human resources. I would really love to know what method they used to get access to that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> they, are the first study that I know of that didn't just track library use as circulations yes or no, or circulations number, you know, checked out 10 things this year. This is the first study I know of where they actually captured bibliographic level data. I know what you're thinking, just stay calm, stay calm. Okay, so they did exactly what our inter integrated library systems um, are programmed not to do. They, they tracked the user to what they checked out by doing a weekly snapshot from their ILS. They pulled out what they had checked out um, because the ILS wouldn't do it and kept it anyway. I know, I know, I was, I was shocked when I read it too. 
But they learned a lot of things. This, at this institution, this, or at one of the institutions that was involved in this, they also have um, turnstile where you have to swipe your card when you enter the library. So they knew that too. They know who's in their facility. Think of the space uh, implications of that. And then um, they, they you know, mashed all this data together to figure out what, what relationships existed. Faculty checked out fewer materials in one semester than undergraduate students. Yeah. Although there was a relationship between, um, for most undergraduates, the use of the library and um, GPA is somewhat low, wasn't statistically significant. There was a definite level of um, a relationship between library use and seniors and their GPA, which I felt was really interesting. That's the first one of this type um, that I've seen. A lot of, um, because of the Oakleaf um, report, a lot of our studies, I think, are focusing on first time freshmen or maybe even transfer students, but this was a, a good study that, to show that there's activity and things to be said about uh, graduate level or nearing graduate level as well. Okay, sorry, we're gonna road trip back. We're almost there. And then when it comes to when it comes to reaching the things that were on the right side of that column, uh, or even the the bottom part of that left column, where we are reaching. Um, being able to communicate library value to faculty-based initiatives or institutional level ones. I think the best example of this is the work that Carol Tenneper has been doing really before the value um, of academic libraries report came out. So this is just one of the, the many where she tracked return on investment really through, sur through a survey method with faculty to figure out how much they valued the resources that they had access to through their academic library. And here are a couple of the, the comments that she got through that, through that assessment method, through that survey method. Um, the, she's really the first and the earliest to do this type of work. But most of the other things on those two lists have not been tackled yet, right? Do you all know of any studies that have really started looking at library impact on, on grant funding or um, institutional prestige. Not much yet, right? We have, that's why you're here, we have a lot of good work to do. So keep this stuff in mind, you know, what, what could we see if we started to track library use to the user, if we started to f actually um, figure out, rather than what people's perception of our work is, instead of that, that we focus more on what they're actually doing in our space and doing with our resources and what changing things up could actually do. Um, there is, hold on, I wanted to read a quote and of course my, my thing is timed out. One of the citations that um, I've given you on your list is from a recently published book. Uh, it's the Matthews book, Library Assessment in Higher Education. It was published in 2014. I started reading it and one of the very first lines in the book, this is um, quoting Jerry Campbell. Given the events of the past decade, academic librarians perhaps know better than anyone else that the institutions they manage in their own roles may face extinction over the next decade. That was on the very first page of that assessment level book. So don't come to assessment out of fear. Right? I think we make bad decisions when we, when we think this is my profession and I have to save it. Uh, instead, think about curiosity and what we could see and then what we could communicate about what we do so that we continue to do it better. Um, if we do assessment and we find that the library is no longer necessary to our institution, that, that could potentially happen. But we're gonna continue to do assessment not so that we make sure that we are valuable, but that we know what value we have and that we communicate it well. Uh, here's some other words that I found when I was looking at largely stuff published before the value report came out. Um, 
extinction, tsunami, and autopsy. <laughs> I have strong feelings. Uh, and then if you were interested in continuing this further based on the comments that you all said when you introduced yourselves and even the, the questions that you've had since then, I highly recommend um, two communities for you. One is around the Library Assessment Conference. It's an ACRL-ARL partnership. Um, there's great work coming out of, of that conference and the people associated with it. And then a slightly different community is the evidence-based library and information practice, EBLIP community. And um, these two communities, I, I expect it to be the same thing, but I found largely that they aren't. Um, the assessment community uh, tends to focus a lot more on the value report, uh, ACRL initiatives and that sort of thing. The evidence-based practice community is really in it for the love of, of the, the measure, the method. They really just have a natural curiosity and um, they are communicating what their evidence is showing, but uh, th they are about the methodology itself. It's really fascinating how these two communities are talking about similar things, but they're doing it so differently. So recommendations, um, that you look into those if you, if you want to continue this further. All right, we have reached the point where it's time for a break. When you come back, um, Carrie and John are going to leave you through um, the active part of our um, pre-conference. So how about 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Okay, great, thank you all. <laughs>